Professor Dhamma Sastri, Professor Venu Goy Dradilu, Professor Atul Prakash, Professor Shama Sundar, Professor Mahatre, and the distinguished delegates to the conference. It gives me indeed very great pleasure to be in your midst this morning on the occasion of the 10th International Conference on Information System Security. I congratulate ICISS on the successful completion of a decade of fruitful uh, service. I also congratulate IDRBT, IDRBT for hosting uh, this conference and doing it in a highly professional way. Hyderabad is second home to me, having spent five eventful years here in this place as governor of the state of Andhra Pradesh between 1997 and 2002. It was during that period that the seeds for a major IT hub were sold. Hyderabad has emerged as a major IT center today with almost all multinational companies um, having research centers or development centers here. I recall uh, laying the foundation stone and later opening the high-tech building uh, that is there at the um, in, that's there in Hyderabad, and now Hyder that part of Hyderabad is being renamed or being called Cyberabad. IDRBT is a research and development institute for banking technology established by the Reserve Bank of India. As was mentioned, I was associated with its inauguration. And the institute brings together three stakeholders, academicians, IT industries, and banks. It has played a leadership role in the adoption of technology by the banking industry. I do hope IDRBT will continue to maintain as an eminent academic institution with a practical bias. Technology, by changing the production techniques, or as we call it in economics, the production frontiers, results in improvement in the productivity. History has shown that nearly one half to one third of the growth that has been seen by the industrial advanced countries is due to the rapid and persistent upgradation of technology and scientific knowledge. Therefore, technology has emerged as the principal driving force for long-term economic growth. Economic growth results from slow and steady improvements in technology, as well as breakthrough innovations. But breakthrough innovations are unpredictable in character. However, whenever they occur, they bring about a fundamental change in the way in which the society is organized. In fact, the world is witnessing today a revolution which in its scope and significance may be as far-reaching as the first industrial revolution. Some describe this phenomenon as a second industrial revolution, while others like Alfin Kostler would call it the third wave, the first wave having occurred thousands of centuries ago when men and women settled down to pastoral life. While the first industrial revolution ushered in an era of mass production based upon scientific inventions, inventions which were basically electromechanical in character, the second industrial revolution is rooted in advances in the areas of electronics, computers, and communication technology. As a consequence, production activities are becoming today knowledge-intensive rather than resource-intensive. The present state of art of information technology has enabled organizations to eliminate completely the differences in time as well as distances. Communications through satellites are fast and effective. Some even call this as the end of geography. Meanwhile, computers have shrunk in size but grown in potential. 
I recall my graduate days. That was a long time ago. Some of you may not have been born. That was in the early, in the mid fifties. When I was a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania, I was working with the Univac machine, which was in the Morse School of Engineering, and it was really a huge machine. And when I said from the basement, it was really in the basement. And those were the days in which when we used to use the punch cards. And if you make one mistake in the punch card, then the entire thing will be thrown out. And you'll have to go back and search where the mistake is. So those were the days. And that is why I say they moved from the desolate computer, the, uh, the, the desolate basements, uh, to the executive desk. Network, standalone, debugging, information highway, all these have become words of common usage. In fact, they are not used only in computer <coughs> world, even otherwise. So people talk of multitasking, uh, borrowed from the computer world, but then use it in the normal language. So wherever information is required to be gathered, stored, and transmitted, IT has a role to play, and that essentially means almost every aspect of human activity. For reaching changes in computers and communication technology have fundamentally altered the way in which banking is being performed. The basic functions of banking have remained the same, but the way in which banking is being, the banking services are provided have altered completely. The days of virtual banking have arrived. Today one gets most of the services for the banking services without having to go or to visit a bank. The introduction of the various technology products has had a beneficial effect. Sri Ramasaski was mentioning about the mid-1980s uh, when we tried to introduce the computers into uh, the banking arena. Uh, those were the beginnings of computerization in our country. But I must tell you, that it was not an easy experience. There was so much opposition to the introduction of computers at that time that the report that he mentioned, the caption of the first report was not the report on computerization. It was called the report on mechanization. And when we introduced the computer with computers in the back offices of the banks, we didn't call them computers. You'll be surprised to know we call them advanced ledger posting machines. <laughs> ALPMs, as you call them. But then uh, we had to overcome that. And I remember even in the Reserve Bank of India, when we introduced the reader sorted machines for the first time to sort out uh, the checks uh, that come to the clearing house, uh, we had a lot of problems. The Reserve Bank was never used to having a night shift. And whereas this work has to be done in the night shift, and whether the rules that are framed in the Reserve Bank of India uh, could apply to a night shift or not was a big issue at that time. So we had to go through a lot of problems. But when I come to the introduction of computer technology in the banking industry, I see three or four stages in it. First, the machines were introduced, or the computers were introduced, only for back office. That essentially facilitated the work. It did not really had an impact on the customer. It's only when we introduced the computers in the front office, then it was possible for a customer to walk in any counter and do whatever business he wanted to, to do. Earlier on, uh, the savings bank work was done in one counter, uh, the, uh, some other work, uh, the current account was done in some other counter, and if you have to take a draft, you have to go to a third counter, and so on and so forth. So then came the computerization of the, the front office. Uh, then, of course, came the most important thing, which is the connectivity. Because uh, how, how do you transfer funds, and how do you um, uh, um, transfer funds from one account to another account within the same bank, and then the next stage of transferring funds from one account in one bank to another account in another bank and so on and so forth. 
So we did go through all the in stages, but I recall at this particular point the uh, kind of trauma that we passed through in the mid-80s in order to, in, to introduce uh, technology in the banking industry. As I mentioned, far-reaching changes in computers and communicate technologies um, have had an impact both on banks and customers. For the customers, the important benefits are what we call anywhere banking and uh, uh, internet banking, ATM banking, and mobile banking. It has also facilitated the use of secure debit and credit uh, cards. For the banks, the major benefits are centralization of customer information, centralized transaction process, centralized accounting process, basic MIS reporting, and real-time uh, information availability. IT has had a positive impact on the payment and settlement system of the country. With some path-breaking initiatives having been implemented in this area, and I must congratulate IDRBT here, because they were responsible for some of the important changes that have been introduced in the payment system in our country. The electronification of the payment system has become um, the hallmark of the decade that has uh, gone by. Electronics-based uh, payments are superior to pay paper systems in, trains, in terms of traceability, efficiency, speed, and safety. Today, data move on high-speed uh, networks, enabling banks to provide services to their customers from anywhere in the world. With over 500 million bank accounts, it is estimated that the Indian banking system produces over 1 billion transactions per day. Uh, these are mind-boggling numbers. Storing and processing this humongous data would have been almost impossible without the help of electronic products which use nanotechnology. With the huge expansion of banking and other services, the bells of caution have also begun to ring. The perpetual tug of war between convenience and safety assumes critical importance in the information uh, system. The network has to be secure. In fact, security at the, is at the root of technology-centric uh, banking. The advent of low-cost and pervasive communication channels, such as internet, has made communication more efficient, but not necessarily safe and secure. Today, the world is grappling with issues such as computer virus, hacking, etc. It is important that these issues are addressed effectively. The need for a secure network for transmission of information becomes essential. Proper identification and authorization of persons and transactions is the most essential feature of financial deals, but now it's also central in all communication and information sharing um, systems, not only really banking, but also others, which carry critical data. However, we need to go beyond this and ensure that the entire network is safe and secure. Because initially, the concern was with really with authentication, uh, authentication and uh, uh, the, um, whether the money is being um, uh, properly taken from the right account and so on and so forth. That is all the initial concern. But now the concern is goes much beyond that. It is really how safe and secure the system is. Cyber security, of course, is a wider term than information security. As the fabric of interconnectivity has grown, the dangers to the system by criminally manipulating the system have also, in, have also grown. Cyber security thus implies safeguarding the confidentiality integrity and availability of data. In effect, it ensures protection of assets which include data as well as transmission networks. The goal of cybersecurity is to protect data both in transit and at rest. Cyber attacks 
aim at a wide spectrum of targets, ranging from mere website uh, defacements uh, to criminal activities, such as service disruptions that impact business revenues to e-banking frauds. Although different types of threats, such as earthquakes, floods, and electrical breakdown, may harm a system or an organization, what is of importance are intentional threats. Well-structured cybercrime can be a threat to a nation's security and economy. In fact, it is not simply a danger to a particular part of the system, it's a danger to the whole economy and to the whole, uh, uh, to the whole polity uh, that uh, uh, cyber security can play, um, uh, can uh, result in. In fact, in the olden days, one of the methods adopted uh, by enemy countries uh, is to inject fake currency into your, into your country. Once the credibility of the currency goes, uh, then the economy is destroyed. So this is the way in which they used to, to do. Now, modern day cyber crimes are in fact even more uh, dangerous. They can destroy the banking system or the communication systems in the, in the country. That is why we need to take appropriate actions. A, to make the system safe. B, adopt appropriate early warning systems. And three, evolve measures to respond quickly to cyber attacks. So all these three elements must form part of any appropriate strategy that we want to adopt. So the system must be safe. We know when the attack is coming, if there are early warning systems, and then also have a method to safeguard the system if an attack is made. I'm not an expert on information or cyber security. There are many here who are present and I'm conscious of their contributions in this field, and therefore we will, we will all listen to them and make our systems more uh, systematic. As the saying goes, to be forewarned is to be forewarned. In countries like India, the, inter the internet penetration rate is still low, making internet access more affordable is a key issue. In fact, when you look at in, the, in terms of the application, there are many, many areas in India where uh, we need to apply the computer technology in order to speed up, in order to improve the, the, the services. Of course, India is a large reservoir of uh, knowledge in this field, and our IT experts are well known, and our IT companies are known all over the world. But when you look at it in terms of the application of IT within the country itself, it is still a long way to, uh, to go. Um, therefore, uh, we cannot underestimate the importance of widening the scope of IT in the, in the country or the cyberspace in the country. But, however, as we expand the cyber, cyber and information space, we must take adequate action to keep it safe and secure from attacks. And I'm sure a conference of this type will go a long way in helping us to evolve the appropriate mechanisms. I wish the conference all success and thank you very much.